Yeah. And also, when you got it, you, you did get two sets of twelves, Austria and France, but it was juries. Do you think if you'd have gone in on a public vote, given the success you had in Britain, yeah. it may have been slightly different as well? The feedback we got was that that would be the case. Yeah. You know, we were getting feedback. We were having so many different nationalities backstage come up to us and say. We think you're going to win. Yeah, you know, nice. you can, you're very popular you're in our changing, country. You're changing yeah. the Eurovision, making I think it everyone was good. up for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted the Eurovision to become more up to date, and we were kind of we, we could have been a catalyst for that. Mm. And a lot of people wanted it to happen in that way, but they weren't quite ready. Gina to, G to turned out to be the catalyst. She did. Yeah, she yeah. did. Going to yeah. number one in so many yeah. countries. Yeah. She did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But subsequent raps haven't actually done very well, despite the televoting. Have you got any idea why? Which ones were they? Just refresh well, my memory. Uh, we've had a Polish rap, Dan? a cup Daz rap, Daz, yeah. but across the board, right. it seems very difficult to rap well. I think authenticity is the big problem. I think there, you know, uh, Jay, Jay, who was the male rapper in Reason, obviously spoke with you know English accents, and most most rap that you hear in the charts, you know, even in, even when you go around the world, is either you know is American based. Uh, and so I think there was an authenticity to the to, to Jay and Reason at the time, and maybe the Polish you know rap didn't quite nail it. Uh, and I think Daz came in a little bit too late, perhaps you know. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I don't know how seriously Daz was taken as a rapper. I'm, I, you know, I, I won't comment. I think that, I think I think that's that's the key here. Cause I think with Love City Groove, Jay and and Yinka were before they got involved with Love Street Group, they were rappers, well, they rappers, were doing their, yeah, yeah. they had their own deals, their own singles, their own stuff out underground on the white label scene and in the dance scene in London. Um, and then I got them in to do Love City Groove. And so they were actually originally rappers in the first place. They weren't sort of contrived and made to do a pop song for Eurovision, which I think is probably where the other ones have fallen down. Mm. Now, a couple of years later, you'd, you'd had the single, you'd had a couple of follow-up singles. You then came into a bank, uh, got together a group called The Collective, who went yeah. into the Song for Europe in 98 to yeah. represent us on home soil. Uh -huh. How did that come about? That was just um, a song that I had um, written uh, for Love City Groove, uh, one of the tracks on the, I think it was on the second album, um, and played it to a couple of people at the BBC and they all just said, wow, that's such a huge you know, potential anthem. Um, why don't you know, pop it in for Eurovision, you never know, see what happens. So we entered it in, um, lo and behold they said, yeah, we want this. So then I had to put the collective together, uh, which was another you know, sort of task of putting together some great singers. Um, I signed them to Simon Cowell at uh, BMG and uh, entered them you know, for the Song for Europe again. Had it changed in those years, the Song for Europe? Because Jonathan King obviously wasn't involved anymore. He was in 98, he was st he's still involved. Um, he, he, okay, he, not allowed to mention Jonathan King, maybe yeah, not. Yeah. Okay, no, he was there. He, he was, he, that was his last year. Then. That was his last year, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. No, so it, I think they were still trying to change it, make it um, sort of two representational, sort of homegrown songs of each country. Um, and it was pretty similar, but only with the playback, as we said before, was different. Mm -hmm. And since then, no one, Eurovision, really hasn't seen you. What have you been up to? Well, I've, uh, I gave up singing for a few years and went back to my, my day job, or my real job as my parents used to call it. Ah, proper job. As a, a proper job, that's right. Uh, uh, it, as a Marvel illustrator, comic artist. So I was actually just working down the road from here, it just turns out, for a few years, uh, as a comic artist. And then I got bored, so I, you know, I gradually started getting back, in, back into singing. And for a lot of years now I've been putting my own shows together, theatre shows, producing, directing and starring in. Um, always works well like that because uh, you, you, you don't have to pay the, the lead, you don't have to pay the lead actor or singer as much money. <laughs> <laughs> so so basically, yeah, I've just been touring the country, uh, you know, singing for my supper really, um, and uh, putting shows together. Uh, well, I've always been involved, kept in the music. Um, I just kind of took a back seat from performing, um, and just through my production company, wrote and produced. Um, I was signed to Warner Brothers for twelve years. Um, and then I, I signed, as you know, the collective to Simon Cowell. Um, I underscored the movie The Real Howard Spitz with Kelsey Grammer, um, Astro Knight's Disney cartoon, um, and a couple of other um, hits in Japan. Uh, Shirley Quan in 2004, that was number one for nine weeks and um, with About Me. Um, and there's a band in Italy I had a big hit with. And so I just been, yeah, more and more music um, you know, through my own company and through my publisher. Now, does doing that, would you put someone into Eurovision now? Sure, why not? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, if you don't have a ticket, you won't have a chance of winning, so sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Now, obviously people always ask, would you go back to Eurovision? But I want to put this in two ways. Would you go back as singers, and would you ever go back as composers? I, 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 I don't sing, I only compose, so I, I, would, I, I would quite happy to you know, write another tune for Eurovision, and may well do, actually. So, um, you know, yeah, I'm quite happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, for me, it would have to be the right song. I certainly would love to compose and sing a song, you know, um, if, the, if the song was right. Mm -hmm. I'd do it differently. I mean, I'd, I'd, if I were to actually sit down and, and compose a song for that show, obviously you would, you would do it with uh, winning that show in mind. When we wrote Love City Groove, we, we didn't, it wasn't our intention yeah, to, yeah, to, yeah. to do the show. It just ended up uh, as being the case. So, uh, yeah, I, I would. And this time you would have put the skirt off. I would. I, well, <laughs> I think once you do that show, anything goes, you know. I mean, no matter what you think you're doing uh, to be over the top in the yeah. Eurovision, once you're on stage, doesn't feel as over the top as it needs to be. What was that know? one we had to so say this year? We Mold had, Mold Mold Moldovia. With the big hats on? Yeah. I mean, Fantastic. You know, I was jealous. I, I thought that's, you know, <laughs> that's the way to go. You're not going to get a chance yeah. to do that on live TV that's, ever that's again. That's pretty go spectacular. For it. Go for it. Mm. Now, you're obviously re releasing your Love City Group song. Why now? We've been asked that many times, haven't we? Yeah, 16 years. Well, it's, for me, it's never gone away cause, because once you do Eurovision, um, it seems um, every year you get asked by BBC or some TV or, or radio network to go and do an interview, go and talk about it. Um, where have you been? What have you been doing? What do you think about Eurovision? So it's never kind of gone away. And it's the kind of song that always haunts you. It's always been played somewhere in the world. I get my POS statements and I go, Okay, where was it played over the last three months? And it's been played in the most craziest places mm -hmm. all around the world. Yeah, same, yeah. Never stops. Um, so it was just, just you know, time had sort of passed long enough. I didn't, hadn't spoken to Paul for you know, 16 years. Yeah. Didn't even know if you were alive. No. Um, I thought, well, let's see if I can get in contact with him. Wouldn't it be a lovely idea um, to get it out to, you know, for the old fans and hopefully get some new fans? Um, and I started to search for Paul and found him, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much said yes straight away. I sort of read the email and my initial thought was, oh my goodness, you know, because for the first sort of 10 years, people would be singing that one line of the song to you everywhere you went How's it in the morning, you know, and that's all you'd hear is in the morning and then it had died down. So I thought, peace at last, you know, so, so when Beans phoned me, uh, you know, emailed me, I thought, whoa, and I had a little thing, I thought, yeah, you know, there's a whole audience out there who've never heard that song probably. Mm -hmm. If you leave a song long enough. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's the right level of nostalgicness to it as well. So, so it, again, as Bean said, you know, the time felt right for me. Now, UK recently hasn't been doing particularly well. We've had a couple of bright no, spells. No. What do you think we're doing wrong? Not enough. Not enough books. Not catchy enough. Songs aren't good enough. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, I mean, Blue, who who quoted us as their favourite Eurovision act, bless them. I I thought did a great performance. Mm. Just didn't think, and the song was probably a little bit too cool and a little bit too right now mm. to work as a Eurovision hit because you just you need that strong hook that you can't get out of your head. In, in, in media, I think one of my favourite all time Eurovisions has to be um, the I'm in love with a fairy tale. Um, <laughs> and, but it was just but you can't the moment it. you heard it, as you heard it, you loved it. Um, not It wasn't something you had to hear twice and go, oh I quite like that, how to go. Actually, as you heard it, you liked it. Well, I did. Yeah, yeah. And I think that also um, struck you with a lot of people because it won with the most all-time biggest votes yeah. ever. So um, that's the kind of song you need. And if someone came to you now and said, I'm thinking of doing Eurovision next year, what would you say to them? <gasps> well, Ooh. I'd have a lot of advice for them. You know, I really would. Uh, breathe, <laughs> for one thing. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, once you're put in front of that huge crowd, that's, um, that's quite a shock to the system in itself. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I would tell them to go for it and just have as much fun as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, if nothing else, that's what the show is all about, just having fun. So, yeah. Do it, yeah. Do it, do it, yeah. And lastly, do you have any message to Eurovision fans throughout Europe and the world that still remember you? Oh, wow, well, yeah. I mean, so thank you for remembering us and tell everybody else about the single that's out. I hope you like the new single. Um, there's another single and a third single and an album to come. Um, so watch this space, it's going to be fun. What's the album called? Can't tell you yet. Uh -huh. You'll be the first to hear. Yeah, thank you. And so thank you very much for this interview and best of luck with the album and the singles that come. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you.